Hello! In his youth, Bruce Lee endured plenty of unpleasant events to eventually achieve world fame. It's a pity he was not able to enjoy it to the fullest. Like many creative people, he fought various inner demons and almost defeated them. Quit looking at him, you touch me, chick. His biography is full of secrets and mysteries, but his wife tried to tell us a lot about Bruce's life in a book she humbly called The Man Only I Knew. This film is based on it. Little Bruce Lee walks out of the temple onto a deserted street. He walks past stone statues which frighten him. The boy stops in front of one of them, and the masked warrior is coming to life, chasing Bruce. He rushes back into the temple, but the door shut right in front of the boy's face. In a dark alleyway, the demon catches up with Bruce and draws his axe over him. Fortunately, it was only his father's bad dream. The man wakes up in a cold sweat and first thing goes to check on his beloved son. Bruce is sleeping peacefully in his bed. The father's ready to do anything to protect the boy from the dangers of this world. Later, the man leads Bruce through the bustling streets of Hong Kong to give him training with a legendary Kung Fu master, Ip Man. The boy quickly gets a taste for it and follows his teacher's instructions closely. He cheers himself up with a thunderous shout as he strikes the wooden dummy. Over many years of training, Ip Man shares all intricacies of the craft with his student. To master them, one must understand that Kung Fu is not just an art of fighting, but also a way of thinking. And the main opponents will always be one's inner demons, fear, hatred, and anger. If you don't conquer them, then a life of a hundred years is a tragedy. Bruce is 20 years old, and in addition to Kung Fu, he also likes dancing. But when he goes to a Chinese Lantern Festival, he sees drunken American sailors burst into the room. One of them rudely pushes a local guy away and starts dancing with his girlfriend. The girl screams and tries to break free while the bully's henchmen guard the guy from disgruntled onlookers. Bruce stands up for the lady, so the American tries to hit him. This proves to be a big mistake, and the soldiers face the agility and power of a kung fu fighter. After recovering from the blow, the chief of their gang challenges Bruce to a duel, insulting him. For this, he gets hit in the head again and then loses his jacket after an impromptu dance with his opponent. In a last ditch effort to win the fight, the humiliated guy grabs the knife thrown to him, but Bruce is ready for that turn of events too and pulls out a hidden chain. He easily disarms his opponent and sends him flying onto the table with food. Hearing police sirens, the fighter scurries away. The rescued girl follows the guy to thank the little dragon, as she calls him. After a night of triumph, Bruce sneaks into his house through the window only to be caught by his father. He says the police came to his house because of the fight the other night. The battered American is in the hospital with a punctured lung, and he has influential relatives in Hong Kong. Bruce doesn't want to go to jail and is going to lay low at his friend's places, but his father drags him by the ear for a serious talk anyway. The man shocks his son by demanding that he leave his native Hong Kong forever. Although Bruce considers it just mere superstition, the father believes that all signs point to the fact that their family is haunted by a demon at whose hands Bruce is destined to die. It all started when the boy's older brother died during childbirth. This is considered a very bad sign. And when Bruce was born, they intentionally gave him a female name and dressed him up in dresses to hide the boy from the demon. For the same purpose, they taught the boy English. But the plan has failed. The demon is getting closer. Since Bruce loves American movies and cars, his father suggests he head there. Besides, the boy was born on American soil during his parents' tour in San Francisco, and this gives him the right to live there legally. And his father has saved up enough money to make the plan happen. Surprised, Bruce doesn't know what to say. Tell me you'll make a big noise in America so I can hear it over here. The guy boards a ship, burning with anticipation of finding himself in the land of endless possibilities. He strikes up a conversation with another passenger, showing him a poster of his favorite actor, James Dean. But the man turns out to be a history teacher and replies that the Chinese have no chance of making it in the country. They are treated as second-class citizens, and many of their countrymen have died doing hard work in railroad construction. Nevertheless, Bruce believes he can do it. He soon feels the discrimination on his own skin. After crossing the ocean, he finds himself in San Francisco. Here, he is forced to earn pennies as a dishwasher in a Chinese restaurant. Only the pretty waitress April brightens his day with her smile. Mr. Ho, the cook is clearly unhappy with the flirting that goes on in front of him and deliberately makes Bruce work more. Miss Yang, the owner of the establishment, eases the tension between the men by ordering them to do their jobs. Despite the difficult situation, Bruce continues to train regularly. He also diligently studies English. 
Of course, when April knocks on his door, the guy forgets about everything else. Later, their workplace romance finally infuriates Mr. Ho, but Bruce doesn't let the man hurt him and gives him a good kick. The cook pounces on the cheeky young man with a knife. Bruce defends himself, but the rest of the workers side with Ho and throw the new guy out the back door. Four chefs with wide meat-cutting blades rush out in pursuit of the fleeing dishwasher. Bruce climbs a metal structure several meters above the ground and uses his balancing skills to throw the pursuers off of it. Once on the ground, the guy receives a painful cut from Ho's strike, but that only enrages the fighter. He deftly strips the guy of his weapon, but the man doesn't give up and takes Bruce in a hold. After escaping from the chef's clutches, the guy is ready to take him out, but decides to show mercy. The scuffle is ended by Miss Yang, who finds that the work is interrupted. She drives the spectators and the brawlers indoors. Afterwards, she summons Bruce for a face-to-face -face conversation. She pays him his salary and also offers to borrow a considerable sum from her. In an ingratiating tone, the woman offers to take April to an expensive store and to rent a hotel room with her. Once the money is wasted, Bruce would stay to work in her restaurant until his old age to pay off the debts. April would quickly lose interest in the dishwasher too. Of course, there is another option too. Bruce could spend the money on education. You don't have to explain it to our protagonist twice. And soon he is rushing to class in the philosophy faculty. He also remains active in the gym. And one day a local regular, Joe, asks him rudely to vacate a training machine. When Bruce refuses, the situation gets heated. Your kind don't understand English. My kind? Yeah, gooks, chinks, your kind. Joe declares that the Koreans have killed his father, and he is not happy to see one of them in the gym. It seems about time to give the ignorant guy a lesson in history and geography, but Bruce doesn't show his emotions and calmly steps aside. The thugs are celebrating their victory, but the fighter is determined to finish his training and challenges the offender to a fight. Joe is forced to wait before his overseas opponent takes off his boots and socks, after which he lunges at Bruce with his fists. Lee dodges easily, though complimenting the boxer's style in the process. The guy easily throws him onto the ground and lands a couple of accurate punches that send Joe and his buddies who also get into the fight, to the floor. The lesson is over. Sorry about your father. That was Koreans. I'm an American. Bruce hastily leaves the makeshift ring to avoid trouble, but Joe's friends Benny and Ted catch up with him. The guy gets tense, but the two come in peace. They are very impressed with Bruce's skills and want him to teach them Kung Fu. Soon, Bruce gathers a small group for those who want to learn the Oriental martial art. During the class, a girl named Linda comes up to him and wants to join the group as well. They like each other. At their next meeting, Bruce challenges Linda to spar, and she easily topples him with a quick move. But tactically, losing one battle can accomplish much more. The guy cleverly uses his position to flirt and obtains the girl's consent for a date. In the evening, Linda's friend Sherry gives the girl a ride in a car and helps her trick her strict mother. The girl does not understand how she could fall in love with a Chinese man at all, but Linda does not suffer from such silly stereotypes and does not take her friend seriously. The girl puts on makeup and changes into an evening dress right in the car and meets Bruce at an expensive restaurant. The guy looks gorgeous too. They're both ready to have a great time, but the man at the door refuses them a table. The young couple is having a nice conversation at the bar and Linda suggests that Bruce open his own chain, like McDonald's, but where they teach Kung Fu. All the while, new guests are given tables in the hall and the guy is hurt by this fact. He tries to talk sense into the man, but he coldly ignores his complaints. Bruce is already used to all forms of prejudice. He acts wisely and takes Linda to a Chinese restaurant. Another day, they go to the movies, where they show the classic American comedy, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Linda laughs gleefully with the audience, but Bruce cannot share her joy because he sees a caricatured Asian-looking character on the screen who encapsulates all the negative stereotypes. The girl empathizes with her lover's emotions and offers to leave. They have their first kiss on the street, and on another day, Bruce takes Linda to an abandoned studio where he is going to open a martial arts institute. You know, a good idea makes a man anything he wants to be. You drop a pebble in a pond, you get ripples. The girl is a tad surprised, but quickly becomes delighted that she was able to inspire the guy to accomplish new things. Bruce Lee's Kung Fu Institute is growing by the day, and Linda is practicing along with the guy. Bruce continues his studies at the university and writes his thesis. An earthquake erupts right in the middle of the class, and a gust of wind knocks him down, after which a living statue of an ancient masked warrior kicks the door down. Bruce tries to fight the demon, but immediately collapses from the enormous power of his opponent. The statue silently leaves the room, and Bruce emerges from this strange vision. This worries the guy, 
and his anxiety is noticed by Linda. Bruce does not tell her about the demon, and instead asks when the girl will introduce him to her mother. Linda is not ready to tell her that she is going to marry a Chinese man. The boy is offended because he himself has already told his father everything. Well, since Bruce wants it so badly, Linda agrees to visit her mother Vivian with him. Everything seems to start well, but the fake hospitality quickly gives way, and the woman starts openly talking about her grandchildren, who will be half-bloods and will not be accepted in either the East or the West. Bruce is very hurt by these comments and burns himself with hot tea from the anxiety. He leaves, slamming the door, and Vivian rushes to convince her daughter that she can find herself a better husband. Linda does not listen and runs outside in the pouring rain after her lover. Bruce picks her up on his motorcycle, and they ride off into the horizon to build their future without anyone's approval. The couple has a wedding, and Bruce stops by Miss Yang's restaurant in the suit to return the debt that allowed him to make it. The newlyweds settle in at the new branch of the Kung Fu Institute, and soon they are visited by a guy named Jerome, who wants to take some lessons. And some of the other Chinese teachers, man, they, they turned me down flat. Some of them wouldn't even let me in the door. You got yourself a teacher. Bruce will not abandon his brother in need. They get down to business, and the new branch grows and develops. Soon, a young boy delivers an ominous message in Chinese to their gym. Bruce comes to meet the other martial arts teachers, who are unhappy that he is teaching Kung Fu to anybody. However, the old men, who consider white and black people their enemies, do not get the response they expect. Bruce tries to explain to them that he shows everyone the beauty of Asian culture and brings people closer together, but no one listens to him. The guy leaves after being threatened with being dealt with in hand-to-hand -hand combat if he doesn't comply. Bruce doesn't want to worry his wife with his problems and lies that he has temporarily canceled classes because of tax problems. Linda suspects that this is not the case, but Bruce assures her that he can handle everything on his own. Together with Jerome as his second, he enters the arena to defend his stance in battle. The Masters pit their best fighter against him, Johnny, who recently sent a mugger who dared to attack him to the afterlife. Jerome tries to convince Bruce not to fight, but the fighter cannot be stopped. He gets into the ring against his opponent and hits him with a couple of solid strikes. Johnny counterattacks, even using his fingernails to inflict cuts on Bruce's chest. The guy responds by showing not only agility, but also the strength of his arms and legs. He knocks Johnny down and delivers a series of punches that the guy cannot defend against. His opponent is forced to surrender. I did you I won. The decision is mine. Bruce leaves, but Johnny, who cannot accept his defeat, treacherously kicks him in the back. The guy was totally unprepared for such treachery and squirms in agony on the ground. At the hospital, the doctor shows Linda her husband, whose spine is being subjected to therapeutic procedures in a machine that looks like an instrument of the Spanish Inquisition. She tries to cheer Bruce up, but he feels down and answers her rudely. The girl screams that the man should have been honest about going to the fight, but Bruce responds by merely suggesting that she should think about whether she wants to continue her relationship with a husband who is a prisoner to a hospital bed. He has truly lost hope for the future, but Linda shows him the beauty of the Western culture in which people don't demand self-sacrifice from each other and don't abandon each other in trouble. Despite all the harsh words Bruce says to save the girl he loves from the fate of a caregiver for an invalid, she comes back. Oh, look at the big kung fu man. First sign of trouble and all he does is quit. Shut up. Shut up! Linda has brought a notebook with her to write down all of Bruce's ideas about how he's going to further develop kung fu. The man still resists and is ready to continue enjoying his helpless condition. But the girl aptly notices his weakness of spirit. He used to be her teacher. But now it's time for him to learn an important lesson, to continue living when you're not the strongest and most powerful. The final straw is the news that Linda is pregnant. Bruce gives up and starts dictating his thoughts to his wife, whom he cannot leave to build their family's future alone. While Linda is typing a book about a technique Bruce calls Jet Kwon Do, the man undergoes a painful course of rehabilitation. He has to learn how to use his legs again. He gets released from the hospital still moving around in a wheelchair, but now his fighting spirit is stronger than ever. His son Brandon was born that day. Bruce brings mirrors into his wife's room to ward off evil spirits. Linda asks if her husband wants to hold his son, and Bruce shocks her by getting on his own feet for the first time in nine months. Some time passes, and the young parents receive great news. Their book about kung fu is ready to be published. Unexpectedly, Linda's mother shows up on the doorstep to check on her grandson. Her daughter greets her coldly, and Vivian is about to leave when Bruce insists that her grandmother meet Brandon. When the woman sees the boy and takes him in her arms, all her silly prejudices vanish. Love always finds a way.
Bruce learns to walk along with his young son and regains his former agility. But his first public appearance at a karate championship goes terribly wrong. Bruce gets booed for being too innovative. To prove all the advantages of Jet Kwon Do, Bruce offers to take out any of the attendees in 60 seconds. Unexpectedly, Johnny emerges from the crowd. I bit him before! I bit him again! Linda is beside herself because the doctors have strictly forbidden Bruce to fight. But now there is too much at stake. Linda doesn't want to see her husband suffer again and says she can't bear to see the story repeat itself. Bruce is more confident of victory than ever and comes out for a rematch. Like the first time, he deftly dodges all of Johnny's attempts to get to him, but loses his concentration for a second and gets stabbed in the aching back again. The dirtbag celebrates his victory, but Bruce comes to his senses and gets to work. A powerful punch takes Johnny out of the ring. The timer stops before 60 seconds. The audience applauds, and among them is TV producer Bill Krager. He is looking for talent and calls Bruce to repeat his moves on the set of the television series, The Green Hornet. The boy's childhood dream is about to come true. He ends up in Hollywood. While the director is instructing Bruce, behind the scenes there was already talk about the fact that Asian appearance is not very suitable for his character. But as soon as the fighter walks onto the set, the crew's amazed. This is exactly what they were looking for. Soon, Bill and Bruce are enthusiastically discussing a possible sequel to the series starring the fighter. Together with his wife, they visit the producer at his mansion. At the party, the couple dances and Linda decides to announce her second pregnancy. Bruce is over the moon, but he is quickly brought down to earth. Bill gets a call and announces that their series is being shut down. Yes, this happens with many interesting shows, but Bruce is not here to get discouraged and will continue to pursue his goals in anticipation of a good moment. But harsh reality brings new challenges. Money is getting scarcer, and Linda worries that their second child will be born in a new, cheaper home. Moreover, one night Bruce is informed of his father's sudden death. He rushes to a funeral in Hong Kong. Bruce weeps bitterly, suffering from the loss. The demon that haunts him begins to appear time and time again. So the man asks for help from his teacher, Ip Man. I thought that was all superstition. Superstition is a name. The ignorant to give to their ignorance. The master claims that this is a fight for which he has been preparing his apprentice. He tests his strength in a small sparring session and is very proud of Bruce's success. The man must defeat the demon so that the curse does not pass on to his son. His father tried to hide and it didn't work. Bruce packs up and boards the ship where a group of men in suits begin to pursue him. They seem a bit too determined when a panting producer, Philip Tan, immediately reveals his intentions. The character of Bruce from the TV series is very popular in Hong Kong and a movie starring the fighter promises to be a profitable project. Although Bruce is hurrying to get back to his family, Philip begs him to stay in Hong Kong for one more day to discuss the details. Negotiations are successful, and Bruce goes to Thailand to shoot the movie The Big Boss. One day, Johnny's brother shows up on the set and demands revenge for his relative, who can't walk or talk after his defeat. Without thinking twice, he attacks Bruce with the intention of taking his life. The crew doesn't understand where in the script this fight is exactly, but turns on the cameras not to miss valuable footage. The fighters take on each other with extreme violence, using whatever tools are at hand, including a circular saw and huge blocks of ice. After nearly losing his head, Bruce breaks free from the grip, but his opponent attacks again and tries to drown him in a muddy puddle. The fighter's body weakens and stops resisting, but the legendary Bruce Lee is not about to die in such a humiliating way, and his trick allows him to take the enemy by surprise. He finishes off Johnny's brother himself, trampling him into the dirt along with their family's honor. After discovering that the cameras had cut the fight on tape, Bruce rips it to shreds in a rage. The man returns to Hong Kong, where after a long separation, he meets his grown-up children and his beloved wife. He happily shows them his homeland and then takes Linda to the premiere of The Big Boss. The theater is full, but at the end of the movie, a suspicious silence hangs in the theater. Bruce thinks it's a disaster and tries to leave quietly but the shocked people were just taking a pause to wipe away their tears. They explode with applause and carry the actor out in their arms. Bruce enjoys his first real success on the screen and stays with his family in Hong Kong, where his career is on the rise. Bill comes to visit and discuss the idea for a movie, Enter the Dragon, which Hollywood is very eager to make. Bruce returns home very late and Linda is not too happy about it. The cinema business takes up all her husband's time and the children do not see their father at all. She intends to move the family to America and calls Bruce to come with her. The man explodes with anger. 
This place has given us a life. I'm somebody, I'm special. Back then, I'm just another gook. The American dream inside him died long ago. Shattered by the harsh reality, the fight ends up unresolved. But Bruce meets with Philip to discuss Bill's Hollywood proposal. This would solve two problems at once, and yes, Bruce still wants to show the West the beauty of Asian culture. But now he wants to be with his family. Without them, his life makes no sense. Bruce's head is throbbing with problems, and he asks for some aspirin. Soon the filming of Enter the Dragon begins, and the actor goes to the set, which contains a maze of mirrors. Suddenly, an earthquake occurs. It locks Bruce inside the mirror world. It's yet another vision. The fighter realizes that a demon is out there somewhere, waiting for him to come closer. To his horror, he is attacked from all sides at once, and the statue of the warrior grabs him by the neck and begins pounding him on the tombstone bearing Bruce's name. The man is losing the battle when Brandon shows up at the cemetery. The demon forgets about the father and begins to pursue his son. Bruce tries to stop the warrior and gets in his way. The man finds nunchucks, which he uses to fight off the foe, and then strangles him with his weapon. He conquers the fear his father has been trying to protect him from since childhood. Bruce leaves the set to spend time with his family. Soon it's time for the last scene of Enter the Dragon. Linda wants it to be a monumental moment in her husband's career. He kisses her goodbye and declares his love. The film was a huge success, but Bruce was not destined to see it on screen. Three weeks before the premiere, Bruce passed away suddenly. More than 25,000 people came to his funeral in Hong Kong. Initially, the filmmakers planned that the main role would be played by Bruce Lee's son, Brandon. He refused in order to star in another project, and this choice turned out to be fatal. The guy died right on the set. He was only 28 years old. The death of his father, Bruce, at the age of 32, is also full of strange circumstances. What was it? A risky lifestyle or a family curse? As always, look for the name of the movie in the description of the video. In the meantime, let us know in the comments, what is your biggest inner demon? And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video so that more awesome stories come out as often as possible.